The Ukrainians have been on the offensive in Zaporozhia since June. Despite some local successes, Ukrainian troops have failed to break through the front and achieve a decisive victory. But the battle for Zaporozhia continues. In recent weeks, Kyiv has received eight ECMS missiles with a range of 165 kilometers or 103 miles. This is a major challenge for Russian logistics, which have already struggled to adapt to the threat posed by the standard HIMARS missiles with a range of 70 kilometers. Commenting on the arrival of the ATACMS Mikhailo Podolyak, a Ukrainian presidential advisor, said, quote, A new chapter in the war is just beginning. There are no safe places left for the Russians. In the medium term, the Russians will not be able to hold the South, Crimea and the Black Sea Fleet. The countdown has already begun. Unquote. We take a look at plans for new Russian railway corridors and how ATACMS is affecting the Kremlin's calculations. On the map. Consider leaving a like if you enjoyed the video to aid the algorithm. When researching videos like these, one of the first places I check to make sure I'm getting the full story is Ground News, an independent app and website that combines thousands of articles from all around the world, so we can compare coverage and see additional context mainstream media doesn't provide. For example, the story on US provided long-range ATACOMS missiles has been covered by more than 150 articles in the last week alone. And we can see that coverage is pretty evenly distributed. By using the comparison feature, I noticed the left focused on Russia's criticism of the US, highlighting risk of conflict, while the right highlights the delivery of shorter-range missiles and cluster munitions against Russia. We can see that over 70% of these articles come from credible sources, suggesting minimal sensationalism. There are also articles from Russian sources, and I value that Grand News includes them and labels them, especially when others omit them. Knowing how the news is presented is just as important as the news itself. I've been following events on the war in Ukraine to make sure I'm getting information from diverse perspectives, to find the story behind the story. I want to thank Grand News for sponsoring this video, and I highly encourage you to check them out as a resource. Check them out at ground.news/goodtimes and subscribe for as little as $1 a month, or get 30% off unlimited access from my link for as little as $5 a month. Since the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, the Russians have faced enormous logistical problems. They forced the Russian army to withdraw from the outskirts of Kyiv in March 2022, and then to evacuate the Kherson bridgehead in November. Logistics are all the more difficult for Moscow because the Russian army is completely dependent on rail transport. This dependence is particularly evident on the southern front. We devoted a broader material to this issue entitled Logistics – Russia's Fragility in Zaporozhia. The current episode updates the material with the latest events. In June, the Ukrainians launched their long-awaited offensive in Zaporozhia. Despite the commitment of considerable forces and more than four months of fighting, the offensive has yielded very limited gains for the Ukrainians. In fact, major advances were only made in two sectors, near the villages of Robotyne and Velika Novosilka. These were only local successes that didn't translate into a breakthrough along the entire front. However, the ground offensive was only one part of a wider Ukrainian operation on the southern front. In parallel, Kyiv launched an intensive attack on the Russian hinterland. The aim was to destroy key roads and rail links and thus cripple the enemy's logistics. During this period, the Crimean bridge came under Ukrainian attack twice first in July and then in August. Part of the road section of the bridge collapsed into the sea, but the bridge was not completely disabled. Ukrainian attacks on the bridges over the Sivash shallow waters linking Crimea to the Kherson region were also only half successful. The railway bridge over the Sivash was only successfully attacked once, in late July, but the damage was minimal. The Russians quickly carried out repairs, and trains carrying war material from Russia resumed running to Zaporozhia. Although the Ukrainians managed to damage some of the road bridges over the Sivash, the impact on Russian logistics was minimal. In fact, the Russians quickly set up several pontoon bridges, which proved sufficient to transport supplies, given the shallow and narrow waters of the Sivash. By early October, after four months of heavy fighting, the situation on the Zaporozhia front looked bleak for the Ukrainians. Although they have managed to advance a few kilometers in some sections, 
The heavily fortified terrain meant that the local Ukrainian successes were not translating into a breakthrough at the front. Attacks on the Russian hinterland also yielded limited results. The Ukrainians made life difficult for Russian supply lines, but did not cripple Russian logistics. Kyiv will certainly continue its attacks in the coming months, but the first round of the battle for Zaporozhia has been won by the Russians. Yet Moscow is not resting on its laurels. Over the past few months, intensive fortification work has been carried out on the Russian side of the front. Existing ones are being expanded, and new lines of fortifications are being built deep into the front line. They are intended to slow the Ukrainian army's progress and break its potential for further offensive operations. However, the Russians are not just building fortifications. In September, it was noted that they have begun work on a railway line that would link Melitopol to Russia. There is currently no such direct link to Russia, and all trains from Rostov to Zaporozhia have to take a detour through Crimea. As a result, Russian logistics in Zaporozhia are very fragile, with the Crimean bridge and the railway bridge over the Sivash in Chonhar being the most weak points. If even one of these bridges were taken out of service, trains carrying supplies to the Russian army fighting in Zaporozhia would be unable to move. Admittedly, as we pointed out at the beginning of this material, the Ukrainian attacks on the railway bridges have not been very effective so far, but the fear of their destruction is certainly keeping Russian personnel awake at night. This is why the Russians want to make their logistics completely independent of the rail link through Crimea. Ukrainian intelligence claims that the Russians' aim is to build a new railway line to provide a direct link between Rostov and Zaporozhia. The line would run between the cities of Rostov, Mariupol, Berdyansk and Melitopol. The Ukrainian reports are also corroborated by British intelligence, whose analyses often highlight the Russian army's dependence on rail transport. Interestingly, according to the British, Moscow has hired mainly private contractors for the project, rather than the Russian Federation Railway Forces, which number some 30,000 men. On the one hand, this is presumably to deter the Ukrainians from attacks that could result in the death of civilian contractors. On the other hand, it keeps the railway forces on standby for the immediate repair of key railway infrastructure in Crimea, should it fall victim to Ukrainian attacks. For the time being, photos confirm that work has started mainly on the section between Mariupol and Rostov. The Russians have taken an ambitious task. To realize the project of connecting Rostov with Melitopol, they have to lay 50 kilometers of railway between Rostov and Mariupol, 80 between Mariupol and Berdyansk, and finally over 100 kilometers of railway between Berdyansk and Melitopol. These are minimum values and assume that the railway line follows the main roads. In practice, because of the terrain, more kilometers of track may have to be laid. It is difficult to say how long it will take the Russians to complete this project. In all likelihood, it will take many years. But the Ukrainians are not losing hope. According to Kyiv, victory in Zaporozhia is still possible. The scales of victory on the Ukrainian side are to be tipped by the delivery of ATACOM's missiles, capable of precision strikes on the enemy's deep hinterland. On the 17th of October, the Ukrainian armed forces announced that they have carried out an operation codenamed Dragonfly. The targets were the Berdyansk and Luhansk airfields, deep behind the front line. It was soon revealed that the Ukrainians had used ATACOM's missiles in the attack. Pictures of the airfields hit suggested that the Ukrainians had received an older version of the ATACOM's missile. Such missiles have a range of about 165 kilometers or 103 miles, and a warhead containing 950 M74 cluster submunitions. Operation Dragonfly has been a complete success. Satellite imagery confirms the destruction or damage of up to 21 Russian helicopters at the Berdyansk and Luhansk airfields. These are some of the biggest losses suffered by the Russian Air Force since the start of the war. It is no coincidence that the Berdyansk and Luhansk airfields fell victim to Operation Dragonfly. The helicopters based there played a key role in the Russian defense of Zaporizhia. They acted as a kind of fire brigade. Whenever on any part of the front the Ukrainians began to penetrate deep into Russian positions, the Russians immediately called in their helicopters, forcing the Ukrainians to retreat. 
The arrival of ATECOM's missiles in Ukraine complicates the continued use of helicopters to defend Zaporozhia. This is because it means the helicopter bases will have to be moved out of the ATECOM's range. This, in turn, increases their response time. For example, while helicopters could reach the front in about 25 minutes, when stationed in Berdyansk, they will now take up to an hour to reach the front after being moved out of ATECOM's range. The ATECOM's missiles complicate the situation not only for the helicopters, but for the entire Russian hinterland. In fact, most Russian supplies depots are now within enemy range. Adapting to the new combat conditions will be a major problem for Russian logisticians. In analyzing what countermeasures the Russian can take, it is worth recalling how they adapted to the presence of HIMARS launchers and M31 missiles with a range of about 70 kilometers. The HIMARS arrived in Ukraine last summer. Along with them, Kyiv received M31 missiles with a range of about 70 kilometers. Shortly afterwards, the Ukrainians began an intensive attack on enemy supply depots, which the Russians had unwisely placed very close to the front line. The Russians followed the line of least resistance and simply evacuated all major supply stations out of range of the HIMARS launchers. This lengthened Russian supply lines, but did not cripple their logistics. The arrival of ATECOM's missiles, however, presents a much greater challenge. Although the Ukrainians have received an older version of the ATECOM's Block 1 missile, it is still capable of accurately hitting targets some 165 kilometers away. This means that all of Donbas, Zaporozhia, and even the northern parts of Crimea could now become targets for precise Ukrainian rocket artillery attacks. Russian supply depots within range of ATECOM's Block 1 are not safe and should be evacuated as soon as possible. However, this means that Russian supply lines will more than double in length. Individual convoys will have to travel hundreds of kilometers to deliver supplies to combat troops. Even a delay of a few hours in the supply chain could be the difference between victory and defeat in the battle for Zaporozhia. Kyiv hopes that the ATECOM's missiles will tip the balance of the war in Ukraine's favor. But this is far from clear. According to media reports, the Ukrainians have received a very small number of ATECOM's missiles. Some media reports speak of as few as 20 missiles. Perhaps this is just the first batch and the Ukrainians will soon receive further deliveries. And maybe this one will include ATECOM's Block 1A missiles, capable of hitting targets 300 kilometers away. It is in this uncertainty that Russian planners must operate. In theory, even a single ATECOM's Block 1A missile strike on a target more than 200 kilometers from the front line could force the Russians to push back further on key storage and concentration sites. A second scenario, however, cannot be ruled out. Namely, that Washington would transfer ATECOM's missiles to Ukraine as a drip aid, in small batches, at long intervals. After all, it should be remembered that the Ukrainians had been asking the United States for ATECOM supplies for more than a year, and the Biden administration had repeatedly refused, pointing out that the risk of escalation was too great. Washington blocked ATECOM's missile deliveries even after the British handed over to the Ukrainians in May 2023 Storm Shadow cruise missiles with a range of about 250 kilometers. It is also worth noting the differences between the two. Storm Shadow is a low-attitude cruise missile whose 450kg warhead can penetrate deep into a target such as a bunker, shelter, or the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet Command in Sevastopol. The ATECOM's Block 1, on the other hand, is a ballistic missile with a parabolic trajectory. Unlike the Storm Shadow, it is not effective against heavily fortified targets, but its 950M74 submunitions are ideal for destroying dispersed enemy forces such as the helicopters at Berdyansk and Luhansk airfields. But ATECOMs can be a bridge killer as well. To do so, the Americans would have to supply Kyiv with M48 variant missiles, with a single 230kg penetrating warhead, or with GLSDB, a de facto rocket-turned-bomb, with a 100kg payload. Kyiv is expected to receive the latter later this winter. In other words, although the Ukrainians already had the capability to attack the enemy at the distance of more than 160 kilometers, they did not have the capability to destroy large dispersed groups at such a distance. The appearance of ATECOMs in Ukraine is thus a major problem for Russian personnel. Ammunition depots will have to be evacuated deep into the front line, which in turn will lengthen supply lines. 
In addition, the Ukrainians are sure to target the strategic railway bridge at Chonhar over the Sivash as soon as they receive the GLSDB rocket. Yet it is important to understand that the Atacams is not a miracle weapon that will magically defeat the Russians later this winter. Regular and precise attacks on the Russian hinterland can gradually degrade the enemy's potential, cripple his logistics and prepare the ground for another battle, most likely next year on the Zaporozhia front. Ultimately, however, it will be up to the Ukrainian ground forces to deliver another blow, break the front and eliminate the Crimean-Russian land corridor. In analyzing the impact of ATACOMs on the course of the war in Ukraine, it is also worth considering how Moscow might react to this change. The Russians have no weapons in their arsenal capable of defending their troops against ATACOMS missiles. Therefore, it cannot be ruled out that the Kremlin will respond to the escalation with an escalation. Not with nuclear weapons, but with ballistic missiles. Unable to stop Ukrainian attacks on their hinterland, the Russians may wish to respond with similar attacks on the hinterland of Ukrainian forces. But Russia's stockpile of ballistic missiles is limited after a year and a half of persistent campaign. Nevertheless, Iran may come to the rescue. On the 18th of October 2023, Iran's ban on ballistic missile exports, based on United Nations Security Council Resolution 2231, will expire. Iran can now trade in this type of weapon legally. This is important because Iran has a highly developed ballistic missile program and the Russians have already signaled their desire to buy Iranian missiles on several occasions. When Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu visited Tehran in September, the issue of ballistic missile sales was one of the main topics of discussion. The Iranian Defense Minister, General Mohammad Reza Ashtiani, explicitly stated that Iran was ready to establish ballistic missile cooperation with all friendly states after the expiration of the resolution. It may therefore turn out that the supply of ATACOMS missiles will indeed mark a new stage in the Ukraine-Russia war, but it will be determined not only by the starvation of Russian logistics, but also by the intensification of the use of ballistic missiles, American on the one hand and Iranian on the other.